What is up? Welcome back, YouTube. Today, we're diving into a channel that I haven't checked out yet. But first, a little message from Editor Azu. I was told to do this by Alicia. This video might have or will have a lot of triggering content from sensitive to graphic to probably even gore, a lot of that stuff. So if anybody is uncomfortable with that type of content with really triggering content, then please, please, I would advise you don't press play on the rest of the video. Instead, go check out another video. We have tons of playlists on this channel. A lot you can binge through, daily doses, just anything under the sun. You can have a lot of fun on this channel. With that said, please continue with the video. But you have been warned. <laughs> bye bye. Recommended to me constantly. And for a while, I've avoided it because these videos are long. And I'm talking about Wendigoon. Everybody talks super highly and praises this channel. And I'm excited to see what it's about. And the video that really caught my eye when I was searching through the titles on their channel was the disturbing and controversial video game Iceberg. I watched my first Iceberg video on the channel already. It wasn't from Wendigoon, it was by somebody else, which you can also check out here. But this time, we're checking out Wendigoon. So let's get straight into it. Buckle down, grab a drink, and um, it's going to be a long one because I pause and talk a lot. You got to get used to it. It's how I make transformative content, shoddy. It gonna be long. All right, let's do it. <laughs> oh, hit the like button, subscribe button, leave a comment, please. Please. It's how I feed my children, AKA my dog, Lexi. She needs snacks. Thank you. Hello everybody. Today we are gonna be talking about the disturbing and controversial video game Iceberg. It's been a while since I've covered an iceberg, and since a lot of people have seen my video on the disturbing movie iceberg- Disturbing I movie iceberg? Oh my god, I want to see that too now. I figured that the disturbing video game iceberg was quite fitting. Now I put together this iceberg myself, and it's exclusively made up of the worst of the worst I could find. A lot of the icebergs I see about disturbing video games will spend the first few dozen entries with things like Resident Evil or Silent Hill. Okay. And since a lot of you guys are probably already familiar with those, I want to get to the good stuff first. Well, not good stuff. Terrible and traumatizing stuff, but good for the channel. Every entry- <laughs> Okay, honestly, love the honesty. <laughs> love it. <laughs> it rakes in the view, shoddy. You know what it do. Real recognize real. <laughs> on this list has raised some level of social, political, or moral issue. We're gonna start with games that are just kind of strange or trying too hard to be edgy. And from there, we're gonna get into things that I consider legitimately terrifying. And as I mentioned, okay. most of these, especially near the bottom, are so terrifying because of their real world consequence. Real and world to give myself some parameters. Real with world consequence? Oh, fuck. <laughs> it's gonna be that one of that, was it like COD level? It had a lot of controversy? I don't know, dude. I'm scared. There's a couple of rules uh... that I've set up for this iceberg. For one, I'm sticking primarily to developer publications. What I mean by that is if we're trying to look for video games that are just offensive or crude, there are hundreds of mods and fan made games that people just made at home to be edgy or funny. So to prevent mm -hmm. myself from talking about like, 12 RPG Maker titles that are all disturbing in the same way, I am sticking to things that were made by companies or known game developers. Okay, cool. Okay, I appreciate that. That's cool. It kind of like filters out stuff a bit because some people do stuff for shock and cringe value, right? So fair enough. I appreciate that. Another thing I want to mention is for those of you guys who don't know, I've mentioned this like a lot on my channel here because I'm proud of what I've done. Uh, I used to be an esports commentator, but the problem with that was that I was really rabbit holed into the games that I was working on and the games I was commentating for. So there's a lot of games and a lot of media that I've just missed out on for like a lot of years while I was in esports because I was so focused on what I was doing, right? Which causes me to not know shit about dick a lot of the time because I just haven't really been around outside of my little circle of the internet. So, yeah. Now there's a couple of exceptions for that for individual mods or games that were made by a single creator that garnered a lot of infamy and became popular in the disturbing video game genre. But for the most part, I'm trying to stay away from edgy one-offs that we're just trying to- I love his speaking cadence. At the same time though, I'm like, this video is an hour long. Should I 1.25 speed it? But I'm also like, I like the way he talks. 
<laughs> oh my god, that's so creepy in his background. What the fuck is that? Oh my god, that's so creepy. Hold on, not his face. Hold on, it's this thing. What is, what is that? You feel comfortable with that in your room? Oh my god. <laughs> be shocking. My other oh, rule is oh. that... In that would make sense, actually. You know what, fair enough. ...about like 10 different games that are all the same kind of disturbing, a lot of these games are representative for their whole category. For example, instead of going into detail about like 20 games that all have racist themes, I just have one entry that kind of encapsulates that whole idea. Okay. Same with things like sexual violence or mass murder. Again, just to keep this video... Oh, okay. So just trigger warning in case the video does touch on those things. I think he's saying he's trying to avoid those to an extent. Just trigger warning for everything, okay? Homies, don't put yourself through the mental torture or trauma of dealing with wanting to watch a video, okay? Watching my videos are lit, but if you do not feel comfortable, don't watch. I have so many other videos on the channel for you to watch. Just want to make that very clear. You matter. Your mental health matters. Don't fucking worry about it, you know? It's cool. Prioritize that first. Thank you. Go from being five hours of me describing the same horrible things over and over again. I fear that some of you all may watch that, but I choose not to do that to you, so you're welcome. Oh, also want oh, to mention before w, we get started, w, thanks. I know that I've been slacking on the uploads lately, and I apologize. I have a lot of really, really cool and fun projects in the works that I can't talk about yet. Hopefully, whenever I can talk about them, you all will think that it was worth the lack of videos, because I certainly think that it is, uh, but you're just going to have to trust me for now. Sorry that there hasn't I trust been a you. lot of videos lately. There will be more on the way Thanks. soon. I still love you guys, and thank you so much for the support in my absence. It really does mean the world. And with that out of the way, we can go ahead and get into a long compilation of me telling you about the most depressing... Yay. and disturbing things that I could find on the internet. Oh. Because for some reason, this is how I chose to live. But <laughs> do you know what's even more disturbing than that? Sponsors? That's right, your diet. Yeah, that's right, that's Factor? right. You can't hide oh. from me. I see you in there. I see you with your half-closed bags of potato chips and empty peanut butter jars and soda cans thrown across the room like an animal. It's disgusting. We should do something about it. And nope. <laughs> I just have my water bottle and an iced coffee. <laughs> I'm a good bean. <laughs> we can do something about it right now, thanks to today's sponsor, Factor. Ignore the, like, drawing idea that's, like, second grade arts and crafts level. This is their actual logo. See, it looks... Oh, you did a better. good job. Factor delivers fresh, never-frozen food right to your door and lets you have a diet that is affordable, healthy, and delicious. I understand that cooking your own healthy meals at home can be very time consuming. So a lot of the time I'll just order takeout, but then I'm paying too much for a meal that I know isn't good for me. But with Factor, all of these problems are solved as they deliver fresh, healthy food to your door that wow. is as affordable as it is tasty. From a wide variety of foods that can include everything from breakfast meals like sausage, the competition. Eggs, pancakes, to delicious dinners. Uh, like Factor and HelloFresh are actually, I'm pretty sure they're owned by the same company. Because when I get sponsored by Factor and HelloFresh, they are like usually the same payout person. I never had it before, so I tried it with my whole their opinions. Yeah. Mom has been pushing me to make this ad so that she can use the discount code to order food. Are they actually good for Factor? Factor's okay. I mean, I preferred HelloFresh purely for the like, I mean, that's why I don't really take Factor sponsorships. It's because I tried Factor and I liked it. But HelloFresh, I prefer just making it because it's fresh ingredients. Yeah, exactly what chat's saying. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why I always take HelloFresh sponsorships because I'm like, oh, shit, I actually just use that because it's convenient for me. And also because I'm a piece of shit who sometimes orders too much takeout. Haha. -ha. Even if it's healthy takeout. So HelloFresh kind of makes me stop doing that, which is cool. And also, I don't like going outside. So, W. But yeah, I think factor's okay. I think it just depends. Uh. <laughs> Dude, I did not mean to do a HelloFresh ad read, but technically I am sponsored by them during this video. I just didn't mean to do that. That's my bad. <laughs> uh, yeah. Trays, side dishes, and even smoothies, Factor is the best way to get healthy, delicious food delivered right to your door. And you can get in on this fantastic product at a major discount. Because right now, if you go to factor75.com, 
or go to the link in the description and use the discount code windagoon 50 you'll be able to get your first factor box for 50 percent off that is right half off your first factor box and mm -hmm. get in on gourmet meals that make you feel better about how much you're spending and what you're putting in your body mm -hmm. again that's mm -hmm. factor75.com or the link in the description now you owe hell of fresh money yeah uh just a heads up by the way for when it comes to videos and supporting content creators there's a window of influx that the companies will track based on your relation to these these codes and stuff so whenever these videos drop, when you support it within the first, like, about 30 days is, like, usually what it's about. Sometimes 60, depending on the contract. That's when it matters the most. After a year, it doesn't matter anymore. They don't track it anymore based on that. Because they use different, they use different like, uh, links and verification, and they reset it for them. So just a heads up. So whenever you see a video that's a year old, if you feel like you want to skip an ad, don't feel guilty. It's only when the video's been out for, like, a few months, you're good. You should watch it description with discount code windagoon 50 to get half off your factor order today thank you all so much for watching the ad and thank you so much to factor for sponsoring the video it really does mean the most hope you all check them out link is in the description and that means mom right now go to the link in the description and we are back to the video oh, his mom we are going to go ahead videos? and get into it but as <gasps> always that's so cute thank you for watching on the first tier, we're going to be looking at a lot of the more popular titles, things that either garnered a lot of attention with the media or things that are just kind of bizarre or abstract in their creation to begin with. Bro, I know none of these games. Title, <laughs> Aravos, what are these or games? Aravos, or however you're supposed to pronounce it. All right, this. we're getting into it, baby. So when I went through and picked this iceberg, like I said in the beginning, I have rules for why I added stuff, but really I just put something on here if I found it interesting. Because why talk about something that bores me, right? Um, so this one, I'll be completely level with you, isn't disturbing at all. This oh. is just a really weird concept that I've never heard done again and I had to tell someone. So in Erevos, you play as a vampire who is trying to kill a vampire hunter cult, to my understanding. Okay. It was developed by Greek studio NYX and published in 2002 for the PC. Now, while some consider this game to be disturbing because it uses real photographs of actors, something oh. that was much more common in the early 2000s with PC games, and it features some kind of bloody depictions of those actors being killed. That's not what I find interesting about this game at all. Oh, What's interesting about this game is that, if you'll remember, you play as a vampire, right? So if you try to turn on the game when it's still daylight, wherever you live, whatever time zone you have set, the game won't let you play it. That's so cool. Wait, that's so innovative. Because vampires aren't supposed to be out in the day. Instead, giving you this error message. So it is a video game that can exclusively be played either by changing the date and time on your system or wait for nightfall. And yeah, insert joke about gamers only come out at night, haha. Ha. But in reality, while interesting, while I think it's kind of cute or whatever, mm -hmm. this is one of the worst ideas I have ever heard. All right, never mind. <laughs> I was like, that's so freaking cute. I love that. And he's like, it's the worst idea. I'm like, ow. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> okay, <then. laughs> Imagine going to a pitch now to try to sell your product and you have to tell them that the product is only accessible for half of the buyer's lifetime. The game never garnered a lot of popularity outside of a small cult following uh, and I've never seen this concept done again to my knowledge and there's good reason for that. And while I don't consider the game to be disturbing at all, I found this in research and I wasn't going to not talk about it. So on oh, to hey. our first real entry, okay. we have PETA Flash Games. So a lot of you are probably familiar with PETA. I'm sorry, People the animal safety thing? What the fuck? What do they do, have a cow slaughtering game? What could they possibly have made? <laughs> what? Or the ethical treatment of animals. And a lot of you are also probably familiar with the shenanigans they get up to at animal protest. While a lot of us are familiar that PETA always has a strange way to protest for the rights of animals, a lot of you may not know that they developed a series of Flash games. I had no idea about this. As well. And they can be accessed. I know they have the shock PETA's value website. videos. This includes games like Whole Lot of Lies, where you play as a pig in a slaughterhouse who is trying to escape from the slaughterhouse workers. You can also speak to other pigs who are afraid of what's to come and think that the end is near. Oh my the god! What if a tiny child starts to play this? <laughs> Holy shit. 
Oh, no. I'm going to go talk to the other piggies. Uh-oh, this man's trying to tag me. Waddles to other piggies. Hi, other piggies. My body is in pain. It's aching. Existence is futile. I've been suffering with broken limbs for days. Please end me. <laughs> okay. I'm a go now. Bye. <laughs> Existence is suffering and pain. <laughs> and being that while you can run for a really long time, the game always ends the same way, with you being caught and killed by the workers in the slaughterhouse. There's monkey fries. It says you killed you your friend too. Jesus. The monkey in a laboratory trying to free other monkeys and evade scientists, which as someone who tried to play it, I can say is the worst platform controls I have ever seen. Cage fight, a beat em up with horrible hit detection that has you go through settings like a military base and a research facility while fighting doctors and soldiers to release all of the imprisoned animals. And of course, my favorite by far, J-Lo, Monster in Fur, which is a game that has... <laughs> Shut the fuck up, this is no way. They gave J-Lo a dumpy and everything. Shut the fuck up. Why'd they give her that fat ass though? Hold up. No, ain't no way. Ain't no way. <laughs> Make her thick. As <laughs> you running from Jennifer Lopez as she tries to stop you from educating people on the dangers of fur clothing, as well as freeing the animals that she plans to slaughter to make more fur coats. Oh my god! This, this is incredible. How can you not love it? While a lot of these games have some blood that is purposefully dramatic to get their point across, yeah. the real controversial element to the games is the fact that they exist in order to push their agenda. Which, if you agree with that agenda or not, is totally up to you. I just found out that PETA makes all these weird video games, and I had to tell you about it. Yeah. LSD Dream Emulator, and yes, that is its real title, <laughs> was made by Osamu Sato in 1998. Now, LSD Dream Emulator is outright a form... Who here is taking LSD? Who here? Who here is taking it? I don't like that someone answered you. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> All right. I was going to make the joke where someone says me, and I go, jail. All of you, jail now. And I was going to do that, but then I realized a lot of you guys are just good beans. My bad. <laughs> All right. of interpretive art. It doesn't try to be a standard video game. As a matter of fact, Osamu stated multiple times that he made this for people who do not enjoy or can't play standard video games. So LSD uh. Dream Emulator was made for the PlayStation as a sort of art exhibit. The only real feature the game gives you besides a start menu is a map that allows you to see what section of the dream you are currently located in. Oh, that's With the cool. Only Downers and uppers, that's cool. If you could even call it that, being to travel from one location to the other and simply experience the world you're in. Osamu built the landscapes based on inspirations he had from his own lucid dreams, as well as dream journals from those he knew. Because that's of cool. this, several people who that. see the game says that it gives them an intense feeling of familiarity, despite the incredibly alien format most of these worlds exist in. Given the drastic contrast that's between so elements cool and bizarre. That are known and elements that are staunchly unknown, Many believe LSD. Dream oh no! Emulator. This part just gives me OG Doom vibes. OG Doom players, like that that shit where you couldn't even aim up and down, but you just shoot forward and it shoots the people above or below for you. You know what I'm saying? Does that not feel like what this is? <laughs> the first piece of media that really captured the horror. I never played the new Doom spaces. stuff. And while I Only find the this old horror stuff. fascinating, as it kind of exists as the grandfather to concepts of things like the back rooms as we know them today, oh. I also think this game is absolutely. So, what's the back rooms? They just mentioned, you just mentioned back rooms. It was rooms. made for the PlayStation One, and while it never really saw a distribution in the United States, it did see some level of attention. Is learning about the back rooms worth it? So, there was probably a young child who turned on his PlayStation to play Crash Bandicoot or some jet ski game or whatever, and turned on this and was never the same person no. again. Night Trap was made in 1992 for the Sega CD. The game featured FMV cutscenes, which again was very popular at the time, not so much nowadays. 
In the game, you the player are eavesdropping on a girl's slumber party that is being attacked by vampires. To protect them, you have to move to the viewpoints of different cameras within the house and set off things like traps in order to stop the girls. Are we the creeps though for this? I think we're kind of... I know we're protecting them from vampires and all. But I still feel like we have a problem. Because <laughs> we're... Why were we watching these girls at a slumber party in the first place? ...from being harmed. While I think this is a really cool idea, especially for the time, I can tell you that the plot or the acting is nothing to write home about. What made this game so controversial is that if you failed, your game over screen would typically be the death of one of the girls. Well, I mean, nothing to us cool kids that, you know, grew up on Live League or whatever. This was a problem for a lot of parents at the time because in 1992, there was no rating system for video games. So at the 1993 committee hearing where they had the whole discussion of how video games should be regulated and what their rating system should be, Night Trap was brought up alongside titles like Mortal Kombat. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Imagine you see this game and you're like, oh my god, that's so cute. It's a bunch of girls having a sleepover. I'm gonna buy this for my baby. My baby gonna have so much fun with all the girls at the sleepover. You're watching outside the window there's vampires attacking them they die <laughs> like what <laughs> and a lot of people attribute the b movie s killings of night trap to the reason that you can't buy an m-rated game without your parents permission again not that disturbing by today's standards or for adults at all really but an important footnote in yeah. the history of disturbing media. Fair enough. The first entry of Postal, which was developed by Running With Scissors, was released in 1997. While there have been four entries in the series, Postal 2 is the one everyone remembers. The game allows players to go on mundane daily tasks or cause a whole lot of havoc. If I had to describe Postal to someone who wasn't familiar okay. with it, I would describe it as what boomers think gta is you know how you <laughs> okay yeah you know what i actually on i'm on like, i'm on oh, board GTA, now yeah the goal of the game is to run people over and then shoot them with guns and light them on fire and it's like sure you can do that but that's not really like you know what the the game's about mm -hmm. uh, in postal that is absolutely what the game is yeah about. fair enough <laughs> it's very satirical and very over the top in its presentation but graphic nonetheless Sure, a lot of games will let you... That bitch got her ass out? That she got a whole booty cheek out right there? You see what I'm seeing? Right here? Got like a bikini or bra and panties on? Damn, them polygons go crazy. Damn. Set someone on <laughs> fire or shoot them. But in Postal, you can pee on their corpse, which is really what it's all about. It's graphic and over the top because that's exactly what it sets out to be. And while we're on the topic of games that made the news lose their mind for a couple months whenever it came out, let's talk about Manhunt. Manhunt was developed by Rockstar. Oh, that's North, creepy as shit. The game came out in 2003, with the sequel coming out in 2007. In Manhunt, you oh. play as a man named James Earl. <laughs> less creepy now, less creepy now. That cover was creepy as hell. Okay, Jesus. Cash. I'm not kidding. As he is forced to participate in multiple snuff films. Most notably in the game, oh. whenever a player performs an execution kill, the camera cuts to a grimy handheld camcorder that would likely be seen in a snuff film production. The game didn't that's cool. that much I like that stylistic. Stylistically, that's cool. When it cool. first came out, it was the next year in 2004 when a 14-year-old boy was murdered in the UK and the media began to blame the killing on the game Manhunt. The news around this time... Bro, I hate motherfuckers we blaming deaths on video games. Man, shut your boogity asses up, all right? Like, just stupid. Just stupid. God damn. Time had a field day talking about how the killer was motivated by the game and he would play the game over and over again. Like, motherfucker, it doesn't matter if the person played the game over and over again. No, like, that, it just, it bothers me so much because it's relevant to a story that it came out, like, a week ago. Do you guys know about the person who, um, who, like, got mad because their mom turned off their internet? So, when they started, like, physically fighting their mother because he was playing, like, Madden or some shit, that, uh, his sister tried to intervene and separate the two of them. 
and then he choked his sister to death? That's not because he's an addicted gamer. That's because he's fucked up. And there's a big difference. <laughs> and I hate that the whole, like, the narrative that came out of it was angry gamers internet turned off. That's your takeaway? Like, you're insane if that's how you're going to write this article. But the thing is, is that articles these days aren't written about comprehension. They're written about what can get the most impression and click-through rate. That's the reality. That's why we get shitty-ass YouTube title clickbaits. That's why we get shitty-ass, like, articles that are full of fucking bullshit or terrible narratives. Because this sells. And this has been selling since day one. The more crazy you make it, the better. Right? So, of course, they're going to make hot-button topic issues like this. And, it sucks. And it's because of the game he decided to murder this child. But the only quote I could find that ever referenced Manhunt at all was the parents of the victim said regarding the killer, I think his friends mentioned that he played it. Which is pretty much- Which is how the narrative gets so stretched, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, the parents mentioned, oh, I think he, I think his friends mentioned he played it. <laughs> and then the ma narrative just gets so fucking skewed, man. It's so brutal. For those of you guys who know me from like back in the day when I did like esports commentary, do you know how many articles just twist whatever the fuck I was saying? And I don't mean that they twisted in a bad way, but they like did not understand my notion of feminism whatsoever. They would, like, twist my words to be like, yeah, I'm doing, I'm like, blah, 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 and I want to, like, it just, it was so cringe. My whole point, like, when I was, like, talking to these, like, interviewers was, yeah, I'm a woman. That shouldn't matter. I'm one of the best at what I do, and that's what should really be accounted for here. Me being a woman shouldn't be an exception. It should just be a part of the norm. That's it. That's what I used to say. And then it would get, get twisted. It would get twisted so fucking bad. And I would, and then they'd, they would word questions to me like, how do you feel about women not being a, a, like an active part of the scene? And then I'd be like, women are an active part of the scene. The difference is, is that they don't get highlighted enough. And a lot of time women don't feel safe in the scene. And I like the same goes for men. A lot of men don't feel safe in the scene too, because there's also victims of SA. And it got cut off. The only quote that made it into the article for that segment was the part I said about women. They cut out the part I said about men. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Right? It's like, we can't, like, uh, hello? <laughs> it's so shit. And it's like, when, uh, and it, it made me so mad that, like, me advocating for men became this thing that would get cut out constantly out of the articles that were being written about me because they wanted to be woman focused you can be focused on like, why are we twisting my narrative like it's so bull i'm sorry it gets me really heated I've, I've been through a lot of stuff especially back in the day when it came to articles about me and nothing makes me more mad than invalidating other people's experiences because Men went through a lot of shit in the esports scene that wasn't taken seriously and felt like it was being put on a back burner, right? especially when it came to assault. Like, it was just bullshit in a toxic environment for them. And, you know, I advocated a lot for women in the scene, which is true. I'm not trying to, like, say I didn't do that. I did that a lot. But I also advocated for other factors, too. I advocated for men. I advocated for people to be who have different races to be shown on screen more. Even when an advertiser openly said... We would like less African Americans on the stream because it's not brand friendly. I have encountered that and had to battle the tournament being like, put black people on stream or I walk and I will tell everyone. Like that's, I've been in scenarios like this, okay? So like me advocating isn't something that's like, oh yes, I just love it when women thrive. No! Motherfucker, there's battles in the esports scene. So it's like, holy shit. I mean, esports is pretty much dying now, but back in the day when it was relevant. It's just a speculation. <laughs> because anyway. of that, Manhunt hit the news cycle and became the next subject for the whole are video games bad for kids debate. So in response, in 2007, Whoa. Manhunt 2 was way, way worse than Manhunt that 1. That motherfucker, he got the shower gun. Manhunt 1 had a <laughs> story, and it was just a particularly brutal story meant for adults. Manhunt 2 relished much more in the brutality of it because that was the thing that got the game popular. So people ragged on the game for being disturbing, and Rockstar North turned the dial up to 11. 
on to tier two. These are mostly games. That... <laughs> I mean, one day. <laughs> the day that I am about to get canceled, when, when, when the VTuber downfall happens, I will make an iceberg of all the racist companies I've worked with behind the scenes <laughs> and the interaction I've dealt with, including email chains that prove the racist comments I've made. <laughs> I have witnessed the world burning behind the scenes. Whatever you think you see in public is not nearly as bad as what happens behind closed doors. It's fucked. It's fucked. And for any of you guys who dick ride Japan, for any of you who dick ride Japan like it's the best place to go to in the world, bro, racism isn't like that. It's only like that in North America. Fuck you. Have you been to Japan? Have you dealt with Japanese advertisers? Bro, that's a different level. <laughs> like, holy shit. It's insane. And mind you, when it comes to, like, being in public areas, if you're, like, in, like, I don't know, like, Akihabara and shit, like, that's just super urban and nor like, I would, I'm saying normal because they're not that racist there. It's just normal to see people of different cultures and shit there. In any, like, super urban city, you're chill. If you go to the outskirts, it's cringe. But the other thing that's super important is, like, advertisers and companies, when you're working in the professional aspect, is super racist. And the irony of it, not for me to dick ride China, because I'm not here to do that, because fuck the CCP, but China didn't give a fuck about my race or gender. They're like, W, you're talented as a commentator. Come on over. And I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, we'd love to have you on camera. <laughs> they didn't give a fuck. <laughs> Japan cares so much about hypersexualizing women to an extent that, like, bothered the shit out of me. Listen, I don't mind showing off my body. I'm very proud of myself and my appearance, like, in my IRL self, especially. I'm very... Though I'm a VTuber, I know. This is super off topic, but fuck it, it's my stream. So... Though being a VTuber, people assume that I'm insecure about what I look like. It's not true. I'm very confident what I look like. It's why I leave pictures of me up everywhere. I don't care. But the thing that does, like, get under my skin is when someone tells me to be more sexualized. That bothers me. If I want to choose to do that with my body, that's one thing. If you're telling me to have more sex appeal when my job isn't to do that, like, go fuck yourself. That's it. Right? Because you wouldn't tell a dude to just start whipping out his big ass balls through a gray sweatpants. Right? Showing off the schmeat. You wouldn't do that. So why the fuck is it different for me? And I was like, that's so bullshit. And yeah. And by the way, if I wanted to show titty, I got every right to. But I didn't want to. Kind of sucked. I uh, lived in a kind of rural area in, uh, in Hiroshima, and as a kid, some of the people there were foul. Yeah, and that's the thing is that sometimes people get like these, like these heart eyes or like rose-colored glasses towards pe like towards places they really want to go to. But it's important to realize that you know, people, shit, shitty people are everywhere. That are still kind of edgy or bizarre, just more so. Ugetsu Katan was made by the Tonkin House in 1996. I'm sure I pronounced none of that right, but we're just gonna keep going. The game involves you playing as a character who recently attempted suicide. Oh. Or possibly succeeded in it, but then a ghost brought you back, but then you're alive at the end, but it, it's a Japanese game. It's weird. The reason it's on this list is because at various sections in the game, the ghost takes you down these very strange and, um, like I said, Japanese settings, with each set piece being the story of a different individual who took their own life. Or oh, just, in shit. general, monsters of the afterlife. While this is bizarre in its own That's right, dark as hell. <laughs> it's interesting is that given its themes of suicide, there are several who believe that several of the faces depicted within the game are of suicide victims. <gasps> oh, now, course, Jesus! That is, that, is, that is hardcore? confirmed anywhere, and it's just an urban legend surrounding the game, but given the bizarre nature of the game itself, you can see why. Hatred was created by Destructive Creations in 2015. In The Hatred, you play as a guy who has decided that humanity is awful 
and then goes on a rampage. The game is just you slaughtering as many people you can with as many executions and different weapons as possible. The ending of the game has your character making it to a nuclear facility where he blows up the facility in order to cause the maximum casualties. The game received so much backlash on its Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. <laughs> release that it was temporarily <laughs> taken down from Steam. Or more specifically, it was pulled from Steam's Greenlight program. However, eventually, it was put back up. Now here's what's interesting. There's a story that Gabe Newell, the Valve founder who all the memes are made about, apologized for the game and then had it taken down. When it seems in actuality, he apologized to the dev team of Hatred for taking the game down in the first place, citing freedom huh? of expression and whatnot. Okay. And because of the controversy and how much attention getting taken off Greenlight garnered, Hatred got so much support that it eventually came out in full. And after okay. this game that everyone was clamoring for finally came out, they universally decided that it was mid. <laughs> Which, yeah, the selling point of the game is the brutality w. and absurdism of it all. Not, you know, great controls or story. I'm not Homie even going to that bro. this one correctly. <laughs> Roly Poly's No Nana Korobi Yoki. Yeah. Nana Korobi Yoki? Sure. Translated, the title means Roly Poly's falling down seven times and getting up eight which is a saying in Japan, to my understanding. This game was released in 1997 and made by Osamu Sato, the same guy who did the LSD <laughs> Dream. I, I'm going to just say it right now, I think that creator is just always high as shit. <laughs> I think, based on the other game and then this one, I think they are just in a constant state of awesome bullshit, bro. Later <laughs> game, which when you look at the two side by side, you can probably guess that. Roly Polies was supposed to be a game to help young children learn new languages. Oh, that's However, cool. instead, it became a game to help young children develop new nightmares. Oh. Because these are some of the most terrifying character models I have ever seen. It's also in that weird, uncanny age of early CGI, so, you know, that doesn't help. But what's so interesting and also disturbing about this game is while you've probably seen a lot of games or videos in this aesthetic, the whole, you know, mascot whore or creepy games for kids idea, yeah. this does it all natural. It was a game for children that just so happened to accidentally be nightmare fuel. <laughs> that's, that's concerning. And while the game <laughs> no, is man. a cult hit, as you can imagine, it didn't sell well at the time because people thought it was terrifying. I also think it's kind of hilarious how the artist who did LSD Dream Emulator, and we can understand the idea of kind of out there or, you know, heady art pieces that are kind of disturbing and scary, but weirdly comforting in a different sense. Like, mm -hmm. we can process that. But that guy took that same mindset and was like, if we bend the shapes and colors we built here into this, they can teach children the alphabet. I just heard something fall. Hold on. All right. We're back. Alphabet. For our last one on Tier 2, we have by far my favorite on Tier 2, Left Behind Eternal Forces. Left Behind Eternal Forces is a Christian real-time strategy game based off of the Left Behind book series. It was made okay. by Inspired Media Entertainment in 2006 and places the Tribulation Force against the global community Peacekeepers. The Tribulation Force being the remnant of the Christians left after the rapture and the global community Peacekeepers being a part of the New World Order. In the single oh, cool. player mode, you play as the Tribulation Force as you try to battle against the New World Order while also converting people to Christianity. You also need to manage your <laughs> okay. resources for the survivors at your base camp and also keep your men in the field supplied so that they can get new converts. While you do have weapons, you want to use them sparingly and only when you have to because killing people lowers your spirit level and causes more shit goku would not be cool with that <laughs> for people to defect and choose not to convert in the multiplayer mode you play against other players as either again the tribulation force or the mm. new world order and to all that i ask who was this game for because well the obvious answer you may think is oh well it's for christians who are really into rts games i guess but no it's not 
because it's like making a weird mockery of it. The idea that there's like a point system for how many converts you have and that there's that's a really good point yeah who is this game for <laughs> yeah I, I i was just assuming i was like him i was kind of just assuming it would be for like christians who are just maybe down for that shit okay maybe okay no it's a yeah he got points takes he's you further from god the more people you shoot and it's definitely not for non-super Christians, because who's going to pick up a game called Left Behind <laughs> otherwise? The game I don't know, dog. You're saying for satire, but at the same time, I'm like, am I paying money for satirical content? <laughs> am I to waste my time playing the game? I don't know. The game had several critics on either side of the aisle. Again, people who were not Christian thought the concept was ridiculous, and people who were thought it was a mockery, especially because in the online mode you can effectively play as the Antichrist. And eventually, the game faded into obscurity. I'm not kidding, it's a Nick Cage tie-in game? Are we serious? Are we serious about this? Hold on. I'm real gullible. Uh, Mr. Winnegoon is a Christian himself. Oh, no. I think like, any, any faith or whatever people want to do is cool. Yeah. I'm not here to, I know some people, I have a lot of strong opinions in life. Uh, do you. <laughs> when it comes to faith, when it comes to not having faith or whatever, just do you. It ain't that deep for me, dog. As long as you happy. Big ups, G. One of the funniest stories I found around this game is they planned to include this in a care package program for American soldiers in the Middle East. But after all this public bash backlash started, they decided against it. So there was a chance for a while <laughs> that there were going to be soldiers on their mid-2000s computers in mm -hmm. the middle of Iraq playing as the Antichrist to mow down their <laughs> friend who's converting people to Christianity. Oh. Do with that what you will. Okay. With that, we are on to Tier 3. And within Tier 3, we're going to look at more real-world disturbing factors, as well as okay. games that, again, push the envelope in a political or media sense. Starting with our first entry, Hong Kong 97, which was developed by Happysoft in 1995. Yeah, y'all saw Kanye Quest too, right? What the fuck is that? I don't give a shit about this one. If the people of China invade the land of Hong Kong. The setting of the gameplay being, and I'm not kidding, Bruce Lee's relative shows up in Hong Kong to kill every Chinese person in the world. So it's very ridiculous, over the top, and... Uh... Do y'all know about what's going on in Hong Kong right now? Because it's getting super suppressed, but you guys know what's going on in Hong Kong right now, right? Just putting it out there. Yeah. This is and made this... for a laugh. Except if the player dies on the game over screen, there is a photo of what appears to be a real dead body. Now this oh, was a huge Jesus. question for a long time. Why on earth does this random parody game have just a dead body for seemingly no reason? But thanks to Gooseboose on YouTube, which I'll link his video in the description, it turns out this was, in fact, a real dead body. It comes from the documentary Death Files, which I talked about in the disturbing movie Iceberg, and it turns out the corpse shown in the Game Over screen is the corpse of a man who was killed in the Bosnian Civil War. And it's presented so unceremoniously, I can only imagine the creator of Hong Kong 97. Is there something new? Uh, they're still doing the protests in Hong Kong currently. It's all being suppressed. So for the past, like, fuck, how many years has it been? Uh, we finally started getting information leaked out during the time of COVID about what was happening a lot more because of that. Uh, because we had people who were stuck in Hong Kong and China when it came to news reporters. And since they were stuck there, uh, we were actually able to get information for once because they couldn't leave. And normally we wouldn't be able to get that information. Yeah, so now the protests have changed dramatically. Uh, but the fight for separation is still going on. It's just fucked. It's super fucked. Yeah. What does being suppressed mean? 
Uh, they used to have to bring umbrellas when doing peaceful protests because they would get gassed. So they're basically being smoked out and they would throw gas canisters at them. So they'd have to bring umbrellas to try to shield themselves. Yeah. Um, yes, that's, so, yeah, my, yeah, I used to be a content creator for a platform called Billy Billy back in the day, which is a Chinese platform, and uh, on top of that, I have a friend who's from Hong Kong, and, like, born, born citizen in Hong Kong, and, uh, yeah, like they were my best friends IRL and like the stance of where I stood for Hong Kong mattered a lot to them. And yeah, so I stand with Hong Kong for sure. And I mean, we, we've heard about a lot of dramas in North America or throughout the gaming side of things when it comes to. For, oh, sorry. For those of you guys who don't know over on YouTube, too, um, when it comes to like Hong Kong's um, situation, we've you've probably heard of stuff happening with like Hearthstone and like the rises for that kind of stuff when it comes to like Blizzard games and the different statements put out by Blizzard China versus Blizzard like uh, NA. And it was insane. Like it was insane, like the, the different like ramifications that happened because of the CCP basically being like, we stand by what we did versus Blizzard's other notion from NA, which said the exact opposite. It was really fucked up. It was a really weird scenario to be in uh, for the gamer space. And it sucks because the limited info a lot of people had during all of that, that people were just like, it just, yeah, the lack of information people have about it sucks. At the same time, I want to be very clear about something is that not, don't ever be like all Chinese people are like doing X, Y, and Z because that's kind of bullshit too. Like just remember that it's a government's responsibility to take care of its people and they're failing and they're hurting others actively. And that's the fucked up part. So, and will I get shit for this from the Chinese community? Probably, but hopefully I don't get sued like my friend was for saying the same shit because he got sued for that. So, and if I do, I will stream live for one month straight to raise money to fight the lawsuit. <laughs> Right. Just <laughs> didn't really think about it. They're like, oh, well, your character dies, so we'll show a dead guy. Uh, which is really sad, <laughs> if you think about it. <laughs> Kanye Quest 3030 is a turn-based RPG that centers around a fictional story regarding Kanye West. The game is about Kanye West going to the year 3030 to fight all of these different rappers and artists in the future. The <laughs> game itself the is just lighthearted and fun. Okay. Uh, it has things like lyrical references and song titles to use. So why is it on this list? Or defense in battle. <laughs> and on the surface, the game just seems to be an easygoing RPG title. Yeah. That is, until you dig a little deeper. Next Pope huh? made a great video about all of this, which I will link in the description, but the short version is that many believe Kanye Quest 3030 to be the hub of a cult known as Ascensionism. Several ciphers and codes that are found within the game lead people to believe that it is either a recruitment tool for the cult or it is used by a hub for cult members. Eventually, people found enough information to contact developers of the game who supposedly were a part of this cult, and several of these supposed cult members asked users to send in things like their full name, address, and images of themselves. Now, later on into the iceberg, we're going to get in- Hold up. <laughs> Hold up. I'm gonna be real with y'all. If you are out here playing Kanye Quest 3030, and you start reading too into it to decipher shit, you need more of a life. Anything, any other life decision you can make is a better use of your time. I, right? Because that is crazy. <laughs> like, this is so... Um, this is not me trying to shit on the creator who made... Listen, if you make content out of it and you do like a deep dive, that's fucking cool. I can respect that. I mean, for the people who took photos of themselves and gave their full ass name and submitted it. That's my, that's my, your fucking weird moment. <laughs> for the person who does research into shit like that, that's just cool. 
there's a big difference between the two. <laughs> into a lot of what I believe to be real scary, you know, cold activities and video game stuff. Um, or at least things that I think have more potential to be legitimate. Because in all my research of Kanye Quest 3030, I'm pretty sure all of the ciphers and codes and whatnot are done to just drive attention towards the game. And they're kind of building a sort of ARG. Uh, but it is real that they ask people for pictures of themselves and names okay. and whatnot. And that is always scary online. Never do that, ever. Yeah, don't do Even that. Even if you do want to join a cult. If they're a good cult, they'll already have pictures of you. They should have done their homework. I love Wendigoon. Do you know what? <laughs> that one part, like, actually just won me over to his content. The other parts, I was like, okay, funny, funny. Okay, cool, cool, cool. That part, bars. <laughs> actually, bars. <laughs> and on the note of things that are probably fake, but I'm going to talk about them anyway because it'd be a lot cooler if they were real, we have Station.exe. Station.exe was a comedically simple... Chat, I don't need pictures of you for the cult because we are all rats where we take one form. There's no need for the diversity of differences, for we are one rat, the same rat repeated multiple times over. All right. I don't want your fucking feet pics. Don't be weird. <laughs> Chat, shut up. <laughs> you want my feet pics? To 4chan. The poster said that the <laughs> no. disc was for sale at a local venue, and there was no information about it. When loading into the game, we see that it is as simplistic as a design for this quote station could possibly be. The God player damn. just walks from room to room, seeing a few things that appear to be generated. Turn down your sensitivity, you're shaking. grass around the facility itself with a bridge. Do we even call that grass or green sludge? However, oh. after a few minutes of walking around, I... really strange noises start to play, and then these giant floating polygon heads begin to follow the player. When they make contact with the player, they do damage, and upon dying, the game crashes. One player noticed that on the outside wall of one of the buildings were coordinates. When typing in those coordinates, we can see that it takes you to a location in Siberia. This Siberian station is an abandoned oh? diamond mine that has a striking resemblance to the structure within Station Dog. Oh, Maxi. that's so now, this cool. this abandoned diamond mine is in a prohibited area of Siberia, so no one's able to go up and check out the location for themselves. And to that effect, oh, wait, why that's on actually Earth sick. does this game have a potentially one-for-one -one recreation of an abandoned station building at a diamond mine in the middle of Siberia? Digging into the game's files, there were connections to old messages that were left on the weapons board of 4chan, but that probably makes sense because if the game was made as a sort of hoax, then there were archived posts brought in from 4chan to freak out people on 4chan who might see them. So that's all well and good. But why on earth would it just be this random building in the middle of the tundra for seemingly no reason? I suppose maybe the person... Oh, is there actually an audio desync? Hold up. Is there actually one? ...person who created the game saw the abandoned building on like Google Earth or something and decided... God, that's so fucking cool, though. I love when people do Easter eggs like that, though. That one's cooler. Like, when it comes to, like, other stuff, I feel like sometimes we go to, um... Like, when, when you get when you get weird with it to, to the point out. where it's, like, replicating real-life disasters, I think that's cringe. But my bigger issue is, um... Sorry, I got distracted. Um, my bigger issue is like when it comes to sorry, my my sorry, my least issue is when it comes to like activations almost, right? When you have things in games that relate to real life areas or spots, I just think that's cool. I don't think it's a big I mean it's kind of creepy that it's like a random location in Siberia that's kind of accurate, but like it's cool nonetheless. Out people on 4chan who might see them, so that's all well and good. But why on earth would it just be this random building in the middle of the tundra for seemingly no reason? I suppose maybe the person who created the game saw the abandoned building on like Google Earth or something. That's what I would assume. To recreate it in his game to be creepy. Um, but e even then, like, what what on earth does the giant heads mean and everything else? It's such a strange. That they're always watching. That even though it's a secure area, they're always watching little mystery. I hope it's something terrifying. It, it would make me so happy. Quest for Saddam was made by Petrilla Entertainment in 2003. 
Now, Quest for Saddam was a, an over-the-top shooter that was a parody of Saddam Hussein and of Middle Eastern militants that just had a bunch of stereotypes and featured the player going through with Doom-esque controls and just shooting everyone they come across, eventually killing Saddam Hussein himself. And while there were a ton of these edgy games, especially in the early 2000s, like oh. Muslim Massacre or Zog's Nightmare, the reason I want to mention Quest for Saddam is because Quest for Saddam got, I'm like, sorry, what the fuck was the first one he said? Uh, okay. That's gross. Holy shit. Okay. Ugh. A weird amount of attention in the news, and not in the way things like Postal or Manhunt did, but like positive attention. Yeah, moving on, like exactly. Like, I was like, you know, fuck it, it yeah. I thought it was interesting, um, and that it was a fun way to interact with the war on terror, I guess. So in response, the global Islamic media front made a counter to Quest for Saddam called Quest for Bush, <gasps> which was pretty much the exact same game, only all of the character models of the Middle Eastern soldiers you kill were switched over to American soldier models. And at the end of the game, instead of killing Saddam, you kill President George Bush. Oh. Like, sure, there's been a ton of- You know what? That is a crazy thing to do. I think they're both fucked up for it. But they said, you want to play? Let's play, bitch. <laughs> That's literally what they said. That's wild. Propaganda <laughs> games that were made by- I wish more conflicts were fighted, like, were fought with such petty nonsense. You know? Give me that petty bullshit. That's what I thrive on. One agency to push one ideology or another or whatever. But it's rare to see one side make a game where you kill the other side's leader. So the other side literally goes, no you, and decides to kill the president. To be honest, I don't know if something like that has ever happened again, but it should. That's hilarious. Moving into tier four, we're getting into the heavy stuff. Starting with our first title, Super Columbine Massacre Oh RPG. my god! Super Columbine Massacre RPG was developed by Danny Leiden in 2005. The game is, as it says, an RPG where you play as Eric and Dylan. There's so many sick fucks who glorify Columbine. It's so fucked. Oh god on the day of the Columbine shooting. Eric and Dylan, of course, being the two shooters of the Columbine massacre. The game, as you could imagine, is very brutal. It opens with Eric's mother waking him up on the day of the shooting, Eric and Dylan making the bombs that they plant at the school, which never actually go off, and then you take control as Eric and Dylan massacre as many people as possible. After the shooting, as in real life, Eric and Dylan take their own lives, and in the game, their bodies are shown along with a montage of news footage and witnesses and statements of victims' families. However, this is only the halfway point of the game as it then goes to Eric and Dylan in hell fighting off demons. <laughs> and this is not played in a horrific or serious tone at all. The two of them remark that this is like Doom and eventually they make their way to a plaza where they meet various dead historical figures and fictional characters like you know what, like, <laughs> it is called disturbing and controversial video game iceberg, right? So us feeling this level of discomfort or grossed out, that's what, that's what it is. You know what I mean? Like, we clicked on the title. <laughs> we said yes. So, you know, uh, like that feeling of unease and ugh, you know, you're feeling, yep, or, we're in it. <laughs> um, or Ronald Reagan, <laughs> as well as characters like Pikachu and Mario. Why Pikachu and Mario in hell? In a plaza in hell? Why Pikachu and Mario in there? What the hell? <laughs> what the hell they do? <laughs> Simpson. And it ends with them fighting the South Park version of Satan. I mean, Homer Simpson kind of makes sense. He strangled the shit out of Bart in the earlier episodes of The Simpsons. He just beat the fuck out of Bart. <laughs> that was wild. They really eased up on that later on in the series, but goddamn. Mario kills Goombas. Okay, well. All right. Why Pikachu, though? What Pikachu do? You know what? Let's see if I can ask my fiance. Hi, right, I have a quick question for you. If Pikachu were to go to hell, what would be the reason?
He said, jumped in the tub with Ash. What the fuck? <laughs> He's saying Pikachu killed Ash? Yeah. Damn, I right. Pikachu the equivalent of a toaster? <laughs> that would do it. I'm going to marry the fuck out of that man. God damn. Thank you, honey. <laughs> God damn, bars. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, that's my man. Yep. <laughs> God damn. What the fuck? <laughs> and then Satan saying they did a good job in that whole kill spree thing. So it's strange for a lot of reasons, but perhaps most strange by the words the creator has said about it. So Danny, the creator of the game, All right. says that the reason he made the game is because when he was in high school, he was bullied a lot in a similar manner to how Eric and Dylan were bullied. And it got to the point that he began to desire to hurt these people who were doing this to him. And it wasn't until Danny watched A Clockwork Orange that he said while watching the movie, he recognized Fuck. that just because society has placed him in a predicament, it doesn't justify his actions or- Oh, thank God. Oh, he got a good takeaway from Clockwork Orange. Oh, holy shit. I thought he was gonna be like, he saw the singing in the rain scene and be like, oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> like, I was about to scream. Holy shit. <laughs> Anyone else who's seen Clockwork Orange, you get it. All right, you get it. It's just, oh my God. Clockwork Orange is a great film, by the way. But, you know, fuck. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Evils he would commit in the name of that injustice. I also want to say that having like intrusive thoughts and like violent thoughts in general, especially towards like aggression towards people who've harmed you emotionally or physically, like that's not an abnormal thing, but to to desire to physically act on it is abnormal, right? So like, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your mental well-being. And I think one of the things that really helped me, like I I was bullied at one point in my in my schooling. I was I was really popular for a long time and then there's a guy who kissed me, and I didn't like him, but he kissed me out of nowhere. And then I was friends with a girl who was dating him at the time. It was a whole thing. But I was into this girl, like this other girl, and I couldn't and I couldn't be outed yet because this is way back in time <laughs> when coming out of the closet was horrifying. Now it's kind of cool and accepted. Anyways, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I... I uh, I got bullied the fuck out of by like everybody because I'm like a home wrecker and a man stealer is what they call me, a two-faced bitch and shit got really dark and fucked up. Really dark and fucked This is actually, this is going to get a little bit dark uh, talking about my life a little bit here. So just like, don't watch if you don't want to hear. <laughs> okay, that's that's all I'm going to say for this part. Um, uh, what happened was is that I had a bunch of friends who had a suicide pact with me back when I was in high school. And most of them killed themselves, like three of them killed themselves. And then me and one other girl lived during it. And like, I didn't really have the aggression to want to kill everybody else. I had the aggression of wanting to end my own life instead. And yeah, that fucking blew. So what happened was, is that after my three friends killed themselves, uh, I got like put into a hospital for a bit because I was on suicide watch and I started to get help, which was cool. And my other friend turned to really heavy drugs, which was super unlucky for her. And uh, yeah, that just, that really fucked us up. And what happened for our school was that they, they, they called it the suicide epidemic and they ended up no longer publishing in the paper or on the news suicides anymore because they felt like it was causing kids, like causing an outbreak of suicide back then, right? Now, with this in mind, what happened next was they the school did something called zero disciplinary that they implemented. And the reason they did that was because they thought the school system was being too harsh on the kids to the point where they were starting to take their own lives. That wasn't the issue. The issue was the severity of what was happening. One of the girls, she got gang raped, one of my friends, and they took photos of it. And the boys didn't get press charges for raping her. They got press charges for having possession of child pornography because they took pictures of her naked. And uh, the other one died of a drug overdose. The other one, drug overdose as well. And yeah. So it was just like really fucked up. Anyways, so... Oh, 
one of them hung themselves. I'm sorry. Yeah, one of them hung themselves. Uh, yeah. So everything just kind of was fucked up. And we got into like a situation of when they added zero disciplinary and I came back from the hospital, the level of bullying I faced peaked into a level of like, you wouldn't even put it into a fucking like movie because it's unrealistic. Right? So like, that was, that was the issue there. So, um, uh, <laughs> a little heavy, a little heavy. I, I'm cool to talk about it now because I'm, I'm old as dirt. So it's a long time ago. Um, but the things that really got to me were like, you know, when you have kids who are just completely unrestrained and you find out how dark people can really be. That's what I found out that from people. Don't say the 60s were fucked. Fuck you, man. <laughs> but that's what I found out how dark people could really be. And um, I had people like telling me to kill myself constantly and how I'm a little pussy ass bitch for not killing myself, though all my friends did. And they would like harp on me constantly. And yep, I had people who flushed my phone down the toilet. So I had to keep getting little flip phones. So, uh, because they just kept taking my shit. I had people who would take my backpack on my back and then rip it off. And because they wanted me to kill myself so badly. And like, it became a fixation for a group of people who really wanted me to kill them, like to kill myself so they could feel powerful. And yeah, they actually were the reason why one of the girls killed herself. So the first two died. Then the third one died because of that issue. And then my other friend and I lived. And it escalated and escalated, and yeah, it was, and nothing happened. I like, when I went to like the, the principal's office, we got the police involved at one point, and uh, no, nothing, nothing protected us from that. So, yeah. So, like, when I, like, that's why when it comes to like bullying and shit, I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> some, uh, do I still hold it against them now? Am I still, like, angry about it now? Mm, I think I'm, like, traumatized from it. I'm gonna be real with you. But, nah, I'm not really angry at them. I think I have the deep satisfaction of knowing all of them failed in life, which is pretty fucking awesome. I had one of the dudes who literally was the one who ripped the backpack off my, like, who took my backpack, threw me to the ground with so much force that, like, winded me so I couldn't breathe. <laughs> That same guy DM'd me on Facebook asking for help and advice to become a streamer. <laughs> like, bro. <laughs> I, I, no. <laughs> like, as if we're homies and cool. <laughs> and it's like, he's like, oh, just thought I'd shoot my shot. Huh? Like, oh, man, shit was crazy. <laughs> Fuck that guy. Yeah, I mean, in general, I have so many W life stories and amazing shit I've been through that I'm really proud of and really love. But definitely that experience in high school that I went through was fucked up. And it ended up giving me the like a very, a very strong backbone towards people being shitty towards me on the internet now because I'm like, y'all did not realize. Like, <laughs> I'll get DMs being like, kill yourself, blah, blah, blah. You can't even show your face, you fugly bitch, blah, 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 right? And, uh, yeah, I'm like, cool, dude. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, so for my, the reason why my dad didn't get involved back then was, uh, I didn't want him to get involved because my dad would have just like come in swinging the moment he realized shit was going down. And then my dad like went with me, like he dropped me off to all my friends' wakes and funerals and stuff, which was really cool of him. So he, my dad's one of the reasons why I process death super well, which again, another massive dad W was my dad. When he realized all these people were dying in my life, instead of it being like constant grieving, he made it so that like death was a fun interaction. 
not like not like glorified but like though people die and leave your life you can still communicate with them you can still like go we do this thing called grave hopping where we would go visit like my dead relatives like cemeteries and stuff and even like my aunt who's na- i'm named after and instead of making it feel like really depressing we'd go get fresh flowers we'd go clean their graves like graves like headstones we would go get lunch after we would talk about life like he made sure that I had a really positive experience when grieving and when dealing with stuff like that. So I have a lot of closure and a lot of healing throughout my life from all this kind of stuff. That if I, if I didn't have an awesome like family situation, I definitely wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have had the, the mental fortitude I have now for sure. It was also really difficult to go from being one of the most popular girls to being like in that situation for sure. So I've definitely dealt with both sides of the coin. Uh, mind you, I never bullied anyone because I thought that was really qu- I thought that was really cringe. But I also wasn't a big enough advocate. I always would talk to the quiet people in classes and stuff because I'm really outgoing. But if I noticed people being kind of shitty towards someone, I would just kind of walk away from it. And that's something I do regret because when I became somebody who ended up being bullied, I was like, damn, I really wish someone would stick up for me. And I'm like, fuck, I really should have done that back then too. It's not like I would actively be like standing there. Something happened. I'd walk away. But walking away is still fucked up. So anyways, that's a super long tangent. But hey, that's what you watch these damn videos for anyways. Welcome to the channel. <laughs> so because of that, Danny began going to therapy and got better. But he always sympathized with the position that Eric and Dylan were in. So he claims that he made Super Columbine Massacre RPG. <laughs> as a purposefully over- You're like, I've decided not to leave that story for my own sanity. I mean, you could Google it, which is really depressing because you'll just find the string of suicides and shit. But then you'd be kind of doxing me because it kind of tells you where I live, but where I used to live at least. Yeah. The top statement on how the media and how politicians portray the Columbine massacre. There's a lot of talk in the <laughs> game about things like gun control and about how they're playing video games led to all this. And of course, with the second half of the game taking <laughs> it's place dad hell, it's clearly satirical, yeah. at least to some degree. Now, while that's all well and good for an art project, as you could imagine, uh, the family members of the victims of Columbine weren't too happy with, you know, this whole uh, art project he had made. Mm -hmm. So one of the friends of one of the victims of Columbine ended up doxing the creator, and that's how we know his name's Danny and all, um, oh, because shit. Before, and he was anonymous until he got doxxed. And then after getting doxxed, he came forward with all this stuff, effectively saying, oh, well, it's it's actually, you know, irony or post irony or whatever. But because of those statements, Super Columbine Massacre RPG is held in a weird place of respect by a lot of people who are familiar with these disturbing games. Like every other, I hate that I even have to say this, but every other school shooting uh, simulator or RPG is compared back to Super Columbine Massacre RPG as it being the golden standard. One of these games being... Oh, that, uh, <laughs> this is heavy. <laughs> Tech Rampage, which is a game about the Virginia Tech campus shooting that was developed by Ryan Lambern and came out three weeks after the Virginia Tech shooting. Oh, fuck no. Oh, fuck no. <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. Nope. Skip go. Go directly to hell, bitch. <laughs> Do not collect $200 as you pass go. Go directly to hell, bitch. Oh, hell no. In it, you play as the shooter and you follow the same timeline of events he did from his first two victims to going to record a final video and then going on the rampage before taking his own life. Now, the reason I mentioned that, like I said at the beginning of the video, I'm only trying to keep one game from each category here. Uh, the reason I mentioned the VTech Rampage game is because unlike um, Danny Ladon, who gave all that stuff about how this was actually an artistic expression of his position and his mindset at the time, uh, he, <laughs> the creator of VTech Rampage said he made it, quote, because it's funny. Uh, bro, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that motherfucker too honest, right? Like anyone else that too honest? That motherfucker no. Keep your thoughts to yourself, man. Oh shit. <laughs> Uh, and he put up these donation goals saying that if he is donated $1,000, he will take the game off Newgrounds. If he is donated $2,000, he will take the game off his website. And if he is donated $3,000, he'll say he's sorry. It doesn't matter where you go on the internet or how far down the rabbit hole you've gone. It always gets worse. And speaking of, let's get worse right now. Kate he tried to monetize trying- he tried to monetize being a decent person. That's insane. Yeah, that's, uh, gross. <laughs> oh. Easy Manager is a zoo tycoon type game where the thing that you are managing is a concentration camp. Oh, okay. Right. It is a property manager video game okay. set in a 1940s concentration camp. The original game was released for the Commodore 64 in 1990 by the missionaries. Some of the resources you have to manage is prisoners and food to things like public opinion. And things like public opinion will rise with the more people you execute. But if you execute everyone, you don't have workers. I'm sorry, someone goes, Alicia, take notes and never do this. Do you think, one, do, well, hold on, hold on. One, do you think I'm a game dev? <laughs> Two, the fuck channel do you think you're watching? <laughs> Three! Motherfucker, I ain't writing notes. I ain't in school no more. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> hey, Roman Nova! Thanks for the raid. What up? I hope you had an amazing stream. <laughs> Hi, raiders. What up? What up? Welcome, welcome. We're currently watching a Windigoon video. This one real fucked up, though. I'm gonna give massive trigger warnings to, like, everything in the book. It's called The Disturbing and Controversial Video Game Iceberg. It's real messed up. It's real messed up. <laughs> like, we are in the deep part of the iceberg right now. So, like, proceed with caution. I'm When I'm saying quite literally, trigger warning for everything. If you feel like you can't handle that, you're more than welcome to leave. Okay? Don't you feel like, oh, we're raiding together. Let's go, vibes. No, if you need to leave, you do what you got to do. Okay. Take care of yourself. Take care of your mental health always. Also, I missed you too. Holy shit. I feel like it's been forever since I've seen everyone. <laughs> everyone. Man. But uh, my ass beat cancer. So hopefully uh, I still have like other health issues we have to deal with first and scans and stuff. But hopefully in 20, either end of 2024 or 2025, I hope to come out more. It should be cool. You know what, folks? I feel like that's a good place to stop for this video. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here. We went through some heavy, heavy ass topics today. Will I post this on YouTube? I'm not too sure yet. We'll see what happens. If it's up, it's up. Anyways, hope you stick on the channel. If you wanna check out some feel good content after that whole, uh, yeah, uh, I got like a bunch of daily dose of re daily dose of internet reactions. I got internet story reactions. I got a whole gameplay playlist. I played Henry Stickman recently. That shit was fun. So, you know, you know, if you feel like lightening the vibes a bit for yourself, there's a lot of content here on the channel. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you later. Bye.